We want to say <clears throat> greetings to everyone and God bless you. And we thank you all for uh, being with us today. Amen. Uh, <laughs> we've been having a few technical difficulties for those that are listening online. Uh, but we're trying to get those taken care of. Uh, <clears throat> baby, if you will, make sure that we remain uh, logged in. To this phone remain dialed in. Because earlier it, it logged us off for some reason. It, the call quit. And so, uh, uh, that's like my wife was saying earlier. Of course, the Lord has a word for us this morning. And I'm pretty sure uh, that he don't want this word to get out. Uh, <laughs> and believe it or not, the devil, he'll do things to try to stop God's word. Uh, you have to be clear on that. As, but we thank God for uh, this opportunity to be able to come before you and share God's word with you. Um, here lately, especially over the last few weeks, I have been trying out different, um, I guess what they call body wash, you know, just to see what works good and what doesn't. And uh, as, you may, as you may know, a lot of people, they use the body wash because it makes their skin feel smooth and you know, it, it's like lotion almost. It's almost like bathing in lotion. It's that lather, and it, it makes, you, makes you feel good, you know, makes your skin smooth. It's, it's a lot better than that cheap, rough soap, you know. Uh, that's what, 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 what we think, you know. Makes us feel better. We don't have to put on as much lotion when we get out the tub, you know, or out the shower or whatever. Because of this, this, uh, this particular... Uh, uh, body wash it, it it it's good for making your skin smooth and making your skin uh it just making your skin feel good you see instead of that old soap that leaves your skin all ashy and dry when you get finished drying off and things like that and, and this morning I, I was thinking about that uh that is how the church have become a lot of churches and a lot of people I should say that are in the church because I, I have to I wonder sometimes, you see, again, I've said I've been trying out different uh, soaps, different body washes, because I want to see which one works. And when I say work, I mean, the purpose of getting in the shower is to be clean, mm -hmm. not to get in there and get smooth skin. You got lotion for that. Mm -hmm. But if you're putting lotion on top of dirty skin, what good does it do you? You see. And so I've been trying out different ones because I want to know which one is going to last me. Which one is going to actually do the job? Not just make my skin feel smooth, even though that's part of it. But the main part is getting clean. You don't want to walk, ar walk around smelling like outside, you know, uh, <laughs> within the next few hours. You want some, some, some kind of soap or whatever that's going to make you clean for the rest of the day, in other words. Not just put something on top of you to make your skin feel smooth. You see, you want something that when you are washing yourself, that it, it actually cleanses you, not just give you a good feeling, you see. And that's what happens all, a lot of times with the word. We've sugarcoated it, and we've put a lot of uh, skin soft stuff in it to make your skin, make you feel good, in other words. But let me tell you something. I'd rather take a bath with ivory or with some other rough type of soap that's going to actually do the job rather than having to take four and five baths a day, you know, because the, the you know, it, it's not doing its job. And that's what that's the way the word of God is. It's there to clean us, not there to make us feel good. Amen. You see, God is more than an encourager. You see, he, his word is there for reproof. Amen. It's there to clean us. Not to just make us feel good, even though, you know, God doesn't want us walking around depressed and making us feel bad. But the Lord said in the book of Revelation, those that I love, I rebuke. So repent, therefore, and be zealous, you see. And so we have to receive God's word in that. And so uh, uh, that's that's what we're concerned about. A, f a few years ago, <clears throat> I had videotaped uh, something and I I. I watched myself in that video, and uh, it, you know, even though it was a happy event that I was videoing and things like that, I didn't like what I heard 
uh, I, as when I was watching that video, um, I just noticed how I was. You see, when you watch video of yourself, you you see what other people see, things that you might not see about yourself ordinarily, but you see what other people see, and sometimes it's not a pretty picture. And so, and that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to look at ourselves, you see. Now, we're not going to always have a video camera running where we can see ourselves in the camera and, you know, we can watch ourselves, uh, you know, just in everyday life. And here's the thing. A lot of times when we know that the video camera is on, uh, we put on this facade. Mm -hmm. We put on the best us we can put on. We come to church, you know. All dressed up again with that that uh, nice body wash. We dress ourselves up. Uh, we put on nice clothes, put on makeup, jewelry. And we do all of these things, and we fix up all of that stuff when we come before the presence of God. You see, but it's just like any husband and wife. You know, when you're married to your wife, you see her the way other people don't see her. You see. And you see your husband the way that other people don't see him, you see. And, but you see the real them. And you're living with them. Nobody, you know, you don't go to bed uh, with makeup on and cologne on and all of that stuff. That's, that's just dressed up. But God is concerned with that person that's got, you know, that, that naked person, in other words. Mm -hmm. That person that's in the raw, that's what God is concerned with. Mm -hmm. That person is the real you. Not the one that you dress up on Saturday, on Sunday mornings to come to church, you see. That person is the real you. And, you know, many times, of course, especially when you're courting and dating, uh, you're going to present yourself the best way you can. Uh, your boyfriend not going to see you with rollers in your hair. Or uh, you trying to get to that altar. You ain't trying to scare him away, you see. And so we, we put on our best show <laughs> when we're pursuing somebody. But then the day comes when we finally get them to the altar and everything is everything. And one morning they wake up with all and, and you see what's really there. You know, <laughs> you see what all it takes to go through that process. You know, women going to bed with this face mask on looking like Halloween <laughs> and things like that. You see, you get to see the real them, in other words. And you feel like you can expose yourself to this person. You see. Uh, because, after all, this is me. We're married. I can't pretend for the rest of my life, so here I is. You see? <laughs> and what happens is, we just show that person, us, and sometimes we don't look at ourselves through their eyes. And more importantly, we don't look at uh, um, ourselves through God's eyes. What does God see? So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about examining ourselves. God wants us to examine ourselves. All right, let's go real quick to the 43rd chapter of the book of Ezekiel. 43rd For the last couple of weeks, the Lord has been dealing with me about this chapter, and he finally, I just kept reading it, not knowing exactly what he wanted, you know, what I was supposed to get out of it. Uh... But finally, the Lord revealed it to me, and so we're going, to, uh, we're going to bring it to you the way that God gave it to us. The 43rd chapter of Ezekiel. Now, let me tell you about the different ministries of, of these three great men. We're talking about um, uh, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Uh, Isaiah was the prophet uh, that came before the captivity in, uh, in Babylon before the Israelites went into Babylon and he was telling them, uh, you be sure that you change your ways or God is going to raise up a man who's going to bring you into captivity and you're going to go serve that man in Babylon. And so they did what a lot of church folks do. We're already holy. We're saved by grace. They shook their fists at God and kept going with their unsanctified lives. And so then God raised up Jeremiah. And Jeremiah's message was, okay, you've already crossed that line. 
Isaiah said that you would go if you didn't change. But I'm telling you, you're going. No matter how holy you try to live now, it's too late. You're going down into Babylon for 70 years. So submit yourself to King Nebuchadnezzar, who's God's servant. And the people did what they did. Well, we don't believe that God is that way. Same thing people say today. God is too loving to make us have to suffer. So we're not going. We're God's elect. We're not, we're not going to go under bondage. God is with us. And, of course, they did exactly. And, of course, in Jeremiah's day, they had false prophets saying, well, you're not going to have to do that. You're not going to have to go through that. God is a loving God. He wouldn't do that to you. Except they went in Jeremiah's day. And so when Jeremiah went off the scene, here comes Ezekiel. They're already in captivity. And Ezekiel's message is, now y'all need to pay attention to why you're in bondage. What got you here? See, because before you could come out of bondage, before you can get out of this situation that God has you in, you have to know what got you here in the first place. If God is chastising you, what good does it do you if you don't acknowledge what you've done wrong to find yourself being chastised? And so this is the message. See, these prophets were sent to God's house. Not to people out in the world, to God's house. The Bible tells us that judgment begins at the house of God. You see, it's going to begin there. Why? Because if the world need to get saved, they need to see a standard by which they're going to be saved. Instead of the church trying to do everything that the world is doing and, and competing with them, God wants to raise a standard so that the, the world is looking at us and knowing that there's something different. You see, knowing that there's something to come up to. All right. So we're going to start reading uh, the, the 43rd chapter of the book of Ezekiel. We're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, Afterwards he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh towards the east. And behold, the glory of God of Israel, of the God of Israel, came from the way of the east, and this and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city, and the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Shebar. And I fell upon my face and the glory of the Lord came into the house of the way by the way of the gate whose prospect is towards the east. So the spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house and the man stood by me and he said unto me, son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile. Neither they nor their kings by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. Now let me explain. This is God talking. And he, what he does is he comes and literally stands in the temple, in the sanctuary that they have built for him. And he brings Ezekiel in there and he tells Ezekiel, no more will these people defile me defile my temple my sanctuary no more would I allow this to go on what is he doing he's setting a standard you see in the earlier I think it's in the seventh uh, seventh chapter of the book of Ezekiel uh, around the eighth chapter rather uh, God tells Ezekiel he brings him to the temple and he tells him and he tells Ezekiel to dig a hole in that wall of the of the temple and Ezekiel dig that hole and went and he tells him to peer through that hole and when he does he shows him all of the abominations that's going on in his house all of the abominations that's going on right inside of his house that church folks are going along with and that's what's going on today you see and God has to raise up prophets that's going to do that that's going to show people their sins and their transgressions things that have become commonly accepted in his house as normal Uh, look at the last part of that verse in verse 7, it says, Know by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. He's talking about his temple being defiled by dead bodies. And many of you, you've heard me say this, so let's say this again since we're here again. It's not, it is an abomination to God when people bring dead bodies in his sanctuary. That's an abomination. That's why I don't go to funerals 
where they holding, they got the coffin laid up in his sanctuary. In, in, in the old covenant, uh, the priests were not allowed to be around dead bodies. Only except when it came to their loved ones, to their family members. And even then, they had to go somewhere for seven days to cleanse themselves. So how much more so is God against us bringing dead bodies, setting them right here? No, they have funeral homes for that, you see. That's an abomination before him. Amen. And, and But we, hey, everybody's doing it. They lived a good life. They belong to this church. I've seen churches and have been in churches where churches charge people. They don't belong to the church, but we'll charge you $500 to bury them, you know, to, to preach their funeral, preach them into heaven, and, and, and bury them. No, that's not God's will. Not one place in this Bible will you see a dead body going into that temple. Not one place. You see, if we really believe that this is a sanctuary of God and that we have dedicated these buildings to what God is doing, then we would know God doesn't tolerate dead bodies. If he did, we would just go to heaven in flesh to begin with. Your flesh can't stand before God. Your living flesh can't stand before him, let alone your dead flesh. You'd be consumed, you see. And so God is against these funerals that take place in church. In his what's supposed to be his sanctuary. It, it, listen, you got a dead body in your sanctuary. I can promise you God's not there. I can promise you that. You see, didn't we just read that in the Bible? He's not going to suffer carcasses. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. In their setting of their threshold by my thresholds. He's telling, he's telling Ezekiel what he's, gonna, what he's not going to tolerate anymore. In their setting of their threshold by my thresholds, in their posts by my posts, and the wall between me and them, they have even defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed. Wherefore, I have consumed them in my anger. You see that? Now, let me tell you something. Uh, ignorance is running rampant in God's church. Running rampant there. Because you got a lot of people who say that they are preachers, but they don't know the ways of God. Here, what is God saying by in the setting of their thresholds by my thresholds? What is he saying? That you come and you put your religion right on side of my true holiness and you think that I accept it when the only thing I accept is my word. So you bring all your religious programs, all of the good ideas that you've had, thinking that you can help me win souls, all of your ideas are an abomination to me. God's not going to change. You see, at this time of year, you got church folks putting Christmas trees up, not only in their house, but in the church. Mm -hmm. And we've already gone over that. That's that's God have never supported Christmas. Not one day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were celebrating that way back in, in Nimrod's day, way back in Abraham's day. And God had Jeremiah to speak against it. But, hey, we're going to put that Christmas tree right alongside of God's word and, and think, you know, and just dedicate it to God. No, no, God don't accept that. God's not going to change because you had a good idea. Amen. You see, <laughs> let's think about this concerning Christmas. You can uh, take a club down the street where folks are going to dance and got all these half naked people walking around in there, uh, just give it a name, and, and it, okay, now we know it's full of sin. But you take that same club, and you put God's name on it, does that change what the nature of it is? No. Look at what's going on in the inside of it. It's still full of sin. What's going on, on inside of Christmas? Full of sin. Still full of sin. And, and idolatry. You see? Just because you just because you try to blame it on God, that doesn't change the nature of it. <clears throat> you see, <clears throat> and we say, well, you know, we don't want to hurt the children. You know, let's just let them have their fun. That's <laughs> that's the devil. 
You see, the devil got all kind of fun out there. You better teach those children the truth that is pagan. And God doesn't accept it just because your preacher does. God doesn't accept it because your preacher give it a stamp of approval. Never was it God's will. And not in one place are we told to celebrate it. One place in this word, we are not told to celebrate it, you see. But, but we do it. We'll go right along with the world. Common sense ought to tell us. If the world is doing it, then that means God has nothing to do with it. The world isn't serving God. So, uh, you see, there's got to be a standard, and God is here to draw that line. Is something wrong when the whole world is doing something, but we Christians blame it on God and say, well, you know, Jesus is the reason for the season. He has never been the reason for it. But why? Because even in Jeremiah's day, when he spoke against it, Jesus Christ hadn't come to this earth yet. But we, cel we claim we're celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ and Jeremiah preached against it. No, we, let's take that lie back to hell where it come from. You're going to either serve God with your whole heart or you're going to keep compromising and find yourself in hell. And I'm going to tell you why. Because if the devil can get you to compromise in this little area, he's got a whole slew of other stuff he want to get you to compromise in. Let's think about it. That first generation. Adam and Eve, all they did was eight and found themselves out of the will of God. And what happened to the second generation? Murder was committed. So they went from eating to killing. They compromised with eating. And then that very next generation, murder was committed. You see that? In other words, when the devil gets you to compromise in what you consider small things, it's because he's got something big down the road for you. You see? And that's what we have to know. And so these things are an abomination to him. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 9 it says, Now let them put away their whoredom and the carcasses of their kings far from me. You see that? Far from me. In other words, keep that junk out of my sanctuary. All right, let's keep reading. And I will dwell in the midst of them forever. See, the only way God can dwell with you is if you move those unclean things away from you. Everybody see that? It says we have to put away. Why does God call these things whoredom? The same reason why you would call them whoredom. If you're, if you're married and you got a spouse that's always talking with somebody, that's sleeping with other people, you're not going to readily accept them. And, and you don't want them bringing their dirty body parts back home to you. So why do you think God should accept it when you, when you dip and dabble in the things of the devil? Why, why should God accept Amen. your secondhand Amen. intimacy? Right. You see that? God's not going to. He's too holy for that. He's not going to accept it. All right. Verse 10. It says, Thou son of man, show the house of to the house of Israel. What is he saying? Show them their own house. Show them what they are looking like. Let's keep reading here. That they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. In other words, what is God saying? You, you're putting your post by my post. You're putting your threshold by my threshold because you consider your post. Your building of the material and of the temple, you consider that to be the standard. God is saying, you show them my standard, Ezekiel, and let them see. Now, through the rest of this chapter, what God does to, with Ezekiel is he gives him the exact measurements of what he wants to go on in his temple, how he wants his temple to be built. Why? Because they had got away from what the exact measurements were. You see. And so what is God saying to us spiritually? Let's measure ourselves, examine ourselves by the word, Amen. not by somebody else standard. Well, this church is doing this. At least we're not doing that. You see that? Let's read that verse 10 again. Thou son of man, show the house of to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. In other words, let them see for themselves how far off they are. Concerning the measurements that I've given. In other words, concerning the standards that I've given. Let them see how far off they are. He says, and if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house. 
Now, see, there's two parts to that. You show them, you let them know what's wrong. If they're not ashamed, you just let them go on about their business. They ain't, they're not going to change. But he says, if they be ashamed, then you show them the right way. You see that? And what is God saying? You can't help folks that don't know that they're doing wrong. If folks that's going to make an excuse for sin, you just let them keep on sinning. Because they, they, they're not ashamed of it. You have to be ashamed of sin. You have to know that it's sin and know that God is against it before you change. Why, why would God go through the trouble of showing you the right way when you don't acknowledge that you're walking the wrong way to begin with? No, he's got better things to do with his time. You see, when I open this word and, and share the word with people on, a, on, you know, personally, all they have to do is make an excuse one time for me and I'm done. I ain't got nothing else to show you. If you don't believe God's word, I'm not going to turn flips for you. Mm -hmm. that, that's what Jesus was saying in, in the story that he told concerning Abraham and uh, concerning Lazarus and the rich man. If they don't believe what's already written, the prophets that have already spoken about hell and that it's a real place, they're not going to believe you if you come back from the dead. Mm -hmm. You see? So God's not going to waste his time with hard heads. We better... <laughs> We better soften our hearts and line up with God's word. Amen. Let's keep reading here. It says, verse 11, and if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof and the goings out thereof and the comings in thereof and all the forms thereof and all the ordinances thereof and all the forms thereof and all the laws thereof and write it in their sight that they may keep the whole form thereof and all the ordinances thereof and do them. You see that? Verse 12, this is the law of the house upon the top of the mountain. The whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. You see that? And so God has given us a standard. And so you may ask this question. What does this have to do with us? You know, what does this have to do with examining ourselves, examining ourselves concerning this temple? Because, see, that's naturally what God is showing Ezekiel. He's showing him his temple compared to the temple that the people have built. So you may say, well, what does this have to do with examining ourselves? Let's go real quick to the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians. The sixth chapter of First Corinthians, and we're going to read, start reading at verse 19. And it reads, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? You see how, how that goes with what we just read in the book of Ezekiel? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's the temple that God is concerned with. Not these natural buildings, but your body is his temple now. So the question is, have you built that temple according to your standard or have you built it according to God's standard? It says, which ye have of God and ye are not your own. In other words, you don't get to decide. Lord, I, you know, I'm going to put this out of my life, but I'm going to keep this. Uh, you know, I, I, you know I, I've got to hold on to this. I've been doing this since I was a child, and I, I can't let go. That's, you see. Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, and I like this next part, and in your spirit. In other words, it's not enough to just go to church, raise your hands, and sing to the Lord, and say, okay, God, I've given you yours. He says, glorify him in your spirit. What does that mean? You got to be a changed person. You see that? Which are God's? And so God want us to examine ourselves. Let's go real quick. <clears throat> Let's go real quick to uh, 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter. Second Corinthians, the 13th chapter. 
start, we're going to read verse 5. And it reads, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. You see that? Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? What is he t telling us? That we have to examine ourselves according to God's word to see if we're even lining up with God. To even know whether or not we're saved. We have to examine ourselves according to the word. According to God's word. But let me sh let's, let's go look real quick. The first chapter of the book of James. And we're going to show you what happens. <clears throat> the first chapter of the book of James. We'll start reading at verse 21. <clears throat> and it says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, <clears throat> and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. So what saves our souls? God's word, that standard. That standard is what saves our souls. Verse 22. And this is for the folks that just think it's enough to be Saved by just believing, our works have to back up what we believe. You see, mm -hmm. our actions will always uh, let us know what we believe. Verse 22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving who? You see that? In other words, if we read something in God's word, it means that. And we have to do it. If the Bible says quit backbiting, stop doing it. You see, if, if we are not doing God's word, we are deceiving ourselves. Amen. He didn't say just come to church and listen and the preacher make you feel good and you go home and try to live the best you can. No, he said be doers of God's word. Amen. So let's, let's just end this right here. We can do what God tell us to do the same way we've been doing what the devil's been telling us to do. No, we can't live without sin. If you can live in sin, you can live without it. Now, here's the question. Who has more power over your life, God or the devil? We say God is almighty, but yet and still he's not strong enough to clean us up. We just going to do the best we can. After all, I'm human. You see? No, we have to yield our members to God for righteousness. We have to yield our members the same way we yielded them for unrighteousness. We have to yield them for righteousness. You see that? that when that woman was caught in the act of adultery and they brought her before the Lord, and when the Lord said what he said, he, him that among you that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. That, that's the excuse that people make. Well, you know, we can't judge. God said that, you know, whoever's without sin, let him cast the first stone. <clears throat> first of all, we have to know who he was talking to. He was talking to folks that were trying to condemn her to death. He wasn't talking to those righteous preachers that were standing with him. And I'm going to prove it. At the end of it, what did he say? Go and sin no more. He didn't say just go and try not to do that anymore. That's not a good thing. <clears throat> he told her to go and sin no more. David said, thy word, in the book of Psalms, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So how do we stop sinning? Hiding God's word in our hearts. You see? <clears throat> All right. He says that we'll deceive ourselves if we just continue to hear the word and not be doers of it. What is the deception at? The deception is this, that it's okay <clears throat> to come before the Lord, continue to hear God's word, and still struggle behind the scenes. Is something wrong somewhere? Again, I, I, I always put this out there. Not, you name me one sin that you just have to do. Just one. See, we're measuring by God's standards, not by what religion says. Religion says you can't live without sin. That's not in the Bible. 
There's nowhere in the Bible that says you can't live without sin. That's religion that says that. And a lot of preachers preach that. I can promise you God didn't send them. God sends righteous preachers that's going to preach righteousness, holiness. See, if we could just sin and go to heaven, everybody would go to heaven. The, nobody would be in hell if we could just all sin and get to heaven. There wouldn't be anybody going to hell. We just all, you know, we just all flesh anyway. We just flesh and blood. See, God got a standard. And I'm going to tell you what's unfortunate is that we've gotten way down here in 2012 and some kind of way God's word have changed and say, well, you know, we just all sinners saved by grace. That's the biggest lie the devil ever told. You are not a sinner if God have saved you. Amen. When that angel made that announcement to Mary that Jesus Christ was about to come on the scene, he said, this one, he's going to save the world from their sins. Amen. Well, you're not saved from sin if you're still sinning. Mm -hmm. No more than you throw somebody out in the middle of the ocean. If they're still out there drowning, they're not saved from that ocean. So if you're still drowning in sin, you're not saved from sin. I know this is rough to hear, but it's God's word, you see. And it's unfortunate, you know, that we've gotten way down here in some kind of way. We're just going to tally along with sin. What we're doing is playing with our souls. Let's believe that we can live without sin. There's nowhere in this Bible that says you can't. Jesus, that, the Bible says Jesus came in the flesh and condemned sin where? In the flesh. Not in the spirit, man, when he was just walking around glorified. He condemned sin in the flesh. Why did he do it? To tell you, if you will walk under the same power with that God on the inside of you, you can condemn sin in the flesh, too. Amen. No, he, you know, that was God. But God came in flesh to show you how you can be if God is living on the inside of you. But as long as you're making excuses for it, you're going to continue to fall and you'll be struggling, fighting with yourself. And listen, you'll be a miserable somebody. Let me tell you something. The most miserable Christian you ever want to meet is that hypocrite. That that hear and see what they're supposed to be doing and acting the way that they're supposed to be acting and can't obtain it. You will be a miserable somebody struggling. Why? Because you want to submit yourself to God, but yet the devil still has power over you. You see? <clears throat> Verse 23. It says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. That word glass is better translated mirror. He is like a man looking at himself in a mirror. Why? He's hearing that word and that word is showing him where he is spiritually is showing him himself. But let's keep reading here. Verse 24, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. What does that mean? That word is being preached to him and, and God is clearly showing him where he is spiritually. But as soon as he get from under that word and go home somewhere or wherever it is. In other words, as soon as the word is not going forth to him. He forget how he looked in the light of God's word. Everybody see that? It's just like a man that's wanting to shave. When you stand in that mirror, you're standing there to shave. And you can see where you need to shave and, and all of that. But you don't put that razor in your hand and then just think and walk away and say, well, I don't need to shave. The whole purpose is for you to see yourself. To see where you need to cut and see all of these things. Same thing with women. When put on makeup or whatever it is they put on or they doing their hair, they're examining themselves. You see? And they see where the blemishes are, what needs to be covered, all of these things. <clears throat> but this Bible says it's like a man beholding himself in a glass. When he hears God's word and he doesn't do it, it's because he forget what he looked like in the light of God's word. You see that? You see how we have to examine ourselves in, 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 in the light of God's word? We have to do it in the light of God's word, not in, in what we think, not in, you know, our own. This Bible tells us to examine. What is the root word of examine? It's, it's, the root word is exam. 
What is an exam? It's a test. What does it do? It shows you where you are. If you take a math test, maybe algebra or something like that, that test is to show you what your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, what areas you can improve in. So we are to examine ourselves, in other words, to test ourselves. But listen, what do we test ourselves by? By God's word. Amen. All right, uh, brother, brother uh, Williams, can you come up here and help me just with this little project just for a second here? We're just going to uh, uh, do a little something to show you exactly what we're talking about. And this is what goes on in, in, in the world. Uh, <clears throat> I can look at brother, brother Williams. Now this is what, what takes place, you see, and this is what we do. Uh, brother Williams, I, I can look at brother Williams and I can say, oh, I thank the Lord that I'm taller than brother Williams. <laughs> Amen. I, I, you know, I'm not as tall as what I want to be, but I'm taller than brother Williams. That's my... That's my exam there. As long as I'm taller than Brother Williams, I'm doing okay. And you know what Brother Williams is doing? Well, you know, he's, he's looking at me and he's saying, well, uh, uh, Brother Bolden, he has a little stomach on him. As long as I keep working out and doing sit-ups, I'm okay. And so we just walk around comparing ourselves to one another, not by God's word. God's word says I'm supposed to be 10 feet tall. But no, what am I doing? I'm looking at Brother Williams. That's, this is my standard here. I, I'm better than you, Brother Williams, because I'm taller than you. Mm -hmm. And Brother Williams is saying, well, I'm better than you because I got a flat stomach. And so, hey, let, well, let's just, we can just go to church and praise the Lord because we're all okay. <laughs> mm. Mm. You see what we do? All right, thank you, Brother Williams. Let's go, let's go look at that in the Word. Let's go to the 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians. The 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians. And we're going to start reading at verse 11. It says, Let such a one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. Mm -hmm. In other words, Brother William saved, but he's not as tall as I am, so I'm saved too. Brother Williams commend himself by his flat stomach. Everybody get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We're talking about salvation now. Mm -hmm. Folks got different things in their life that they have struggled with, and so they say, well, I'm not the way that I used to be, and so, and in comparison with this person, I'm okay. Now, I know that they're saved. I heard them speaking in tongues. So if they're saved, and I feel like I'm a little bit better than them because I know about some of the struggles that they've struggled with, then I'm saved too. You see that? And so he says, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves but they measure themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Why? Because if you got a church full of hell-bound folks, then you're comparing yourself to hell-bound folks. You, you don't have any standard. When I was in school, uh, you know, to help the teacher out, uh, you know, with, with the test, uh, I can't remember what were those little things that, you know, you mark, you, you it's got the four of those scantrons, and, and you mark your little answers, A, B, C, or D, or E. And the, the, the teacher, uh, you know, when uh, wanting help, you know, with grading the papers, they would give us the master Scantron. And what we would do is we would sit that master on top of our Scantron. And we would mark what was wrong and what was right, you know, uh, in light of what was marked, you know, you see. And so you knew whether you had one right or wrong in comparison to the teacher's Scantron. You see that? 
And so a lot of times we're not doing that in our Christian walk. We're comparing ourselves with the person across the way from us. Well, you know, in other words, in school they call it grading by a curve. You get the smartest person in class, if they make a C, all of a sudden that C becomes an A and everybody else is graded by that. So even though you made an F, you really got a C compared to Johnny and his A, which really should have been a C. Everybody understand? And so that's what people do in their Christian walk. You got this person not living holy, but they're supposed to be, and, and they're commending themselves like they are. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to grade myself by this person. Instead of graded by God's scantron and what God says. You see that? It, let's not compare ourselves with one another. Uh, let's compare ourselves in the light of God's word. I, I'm telling you something. We'd be surprised where we are spiritually. If, if we examine ourselves by the word. You see? All right, let's keep reading here. Verse 13, but we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God had dis distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. You see that? So we're not going to say, well, thank God, uh, you know, I'm not where I, I, I want to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. Some people compare themselves to their past. And you still got a long way to go. You see, you were just extra dirty. That's all. You might not be what you used to be. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, growing up, we used to wash dishes, you know, growing up. And of course, we still do that now. And, you know, w when you got a house full of people uh, and you got a lot of dishes to wash, pretty soon that dishwater become dirty. Let me make this clear. You can't clean dishes with dirty water. And that's what people try to do. Hey, it's got to pass through this water just like every other dish. No, at some point, you need to run some clean water in there. And what's that clean water? God's word. Not Sister Jones across the way. God's word is the clean water, you see? All right, let's go ahead and keep reading here. Verse 14. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm. I'm comparing myself to you. You only preach, you know, you only do this, but I'm doing so much more than you, so I'm okay with God. In other words, you see that? But having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hands. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Now, what, let's look at the flip side of what that's really saying. When you compare your spiritual growth, it should be according to God's word. Everybody understand? Mm -hmm. That's where the glory is, according to God's word. Not according to your past and what you used to do and how God is helping you and how, you know, how far you've come along. How far you've come along doesn't, re doesn't, doesn't win a race. Everybody understand? Amen. In other words, if you got, uh, if you got to run a mile and the, and the race is a mile and you only jog three times around that track and you're supposed to jog four times, you can't stop and look back and say, whew. Thank God, I, you know, I haven't reached the finish line yet, but I've already ran three quarters of a mile. And, you know, so this is why I'm going to stay put. No, for that race to be won by you, you have to finish your course. Not looking back to see how far you've traveled or ran, but looking ahead to see the finish line. You see, and most of us, we live in our past. So thank God, you know, ooh, I used to be like that. And I just thank God I'm not like that anymore. But no, God is saying we need to step up to his word. You see, we need to step up to his word. All right. Let's go ahead and keep reading here. It says verse 18, for not he that commended himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. You see that? Who does the Lord commend? Those that live in his word. Those that compare themselves uh, according to God's word. Compare them, their living standard to God's word. You see, that is the temple <clears throat> that God is concerned about. 
not not so much as this natural temple, a sanctuary that we build, but that temple that he dwells in. The word of God lets us know, you see, that God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. This is the temple that he dwell in. Now, the question is this. What are we offering to him? The Bible says that we ought to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, not a dead one. A living sacrifice. So uh, are we presenting God with our best? Are we doing what he's told us to do? Not asked, told us to do. You see that? We, you know, we that are married, we want the best from our spouse. We don't want them spending all day somewhere else and then coming home and, you know, have no time for us. We want the best. We want to know when we're married to somebody that we are number one in their lives. Mm-hmm. Not number three, four, and five. Not let me get this done and then I'll give you some time. Mm-hmm. We want to know that we're number one in their lives. <clears throat> you see? And, and so, we, in other words, we want to be pleased by them. We want to know that we, wasn't, we weren't an afterthought. Mm-hmm. You see that? And God want the same thing. Other than that is harlotry and whoredom. You see? He doesn't want us serving sin and then coming to him and offering that sinful body as a living sacrifice. He wants us to live according to his word, according to his standard. And how do we do that? By examining ourselves. How do we examine ourselves? By reading God's word and saying, Lord, you know, I'm not, I'm not living up to you in this area. Now, let me tell you something. God, if we will repent, you know, the Bible says that he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. But, you know, as long as we're making excuses for sin, we won't repent. And as long as we don't repent, we don't receive forgiveness. God is only faithful and just to forgive us when we repent, when we confess. So what does that mean? We read the word. And and when we see something in that word where we're not lining up, we just have to confess it. Why? Because God knows us anyway. It's not like we can fool him. So we confess it. Say, Lord, I need some help in this area. I can't. I'm not living up to your standard, you know. And then God says, then I'll, when you do that, then I'll come in and then I'll help you. I'll cleanse you then. See, but you have to submit it to him. You know, when, when you wear your laundry, <clears throat> when you wear clothes, you put them in the, in, the, in the dirty laundry to be clean. But if you're taking those clothes off and you're smelling them and you're saying, oh, it's, it's good to go for another few wears, it just won't be clean. It has to be submitted, in other words. It, you have to acknowledge that it's dirty if you're going to put it in a washing machine and let it be clean, you see. And so that's what we have to do. We have to acknowledge those areas in our lives that are dirty. And when we do that, then God will submit. Then, then God can clean us. See, he can't clean laundry that's, that's not in the dirty, in the dirty laundry bag. Amen. He can only clean it when it's willing to admit, hey, I need to be clean. You see, so let's examine ourselves. You see, yeah, we may be okay in some areas, but let's examine ourselves in some of those other areas that that may not be lining up to God. You see, if we'll do that, God will honor it. God will honor it. You know, the Bible tells us to be perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. We can do that, but we have to acknowledge those areas where there are imperfections. You see that we have to acknowledge those things. We have to do that. God's not, you know, God can point out all day his word and what we're coming up short at. But until we admit it, it doesn't do us any good. We have to do that. We have to come before him and we have to be honest and we have to examine ourselves. You see, God will help us if we will walk in humility and do that. Amen. Amen. All right. I guess we'll open it up now for any questions or comments.
All right. Amen. Oh, yeah. Um, God has been dealing with me mightily since I've uh, come here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, God has been tearing up my flesh and separating it and allowing me to submit more and more. Well, totally submit. Uh, right, right now I'm in total submission. And um, God ministered his word to me, you know, through you and through, you know, studying his word. And as you was ministering this uh, sermon, God had led me over here to Romans 8, which gave uh, confirmation to everything that you preached and ministered. And, you know, one day I would love to see you preach Romans 8 and Romans 12. You know, because it, it, it really, it really, because it, it's talking about, you know, no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walks not according to the flesh, but, you know, according to the spirit. And it, it teaches walking in righteousness and not accepting your flesh. Mm -hmm. And the more you deny your flesh, the more you'll grow in the spirit. And, you know, um, you know, I was just, you know, the confirmation has set in. And I, I thank God that <clears throat> I think you opened up a lot of people's eyes today by telling them how it was abomination to put corpses right there in the temple of God, you know. <clears throat> and I felt the shame in my spirit not knowing that. You know, that mm -hmm. was the ignorance that, yes, it was bliss in the church that everyone was walking around thinking, okay, you know, it's all right to <clears throat> sit dead bodies at the feet of, you know, God. You know, and that that, that is an abomination because I, I remember the Bible talking about those like the priests and even the Nazarites who dedicated their life over to God couldn't touch anything filthy or be around any dead bodies. They would have to, you know... Um, after they desecrate themselves, they would have to, you know, consecrate themselves back over to God mm -hmm. for a period. And I really thank you for enlightening me. Well, God using me to enlighten me and the body of Christ through this message. And I hope everyone takes heed to what has been said because everything that's preached is not always like said. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I'm running with this and I'm, you know, I feel in like, um, happy in my spirit because a lot of times it, 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 it hinders your flesh what makes you, uh, you know, kind of sad within your spirit when it points out your wrongdoings. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when you're walking in the will of God, it, it has nothing to do with your flesh. Mm -hmm. Denying your flesh draws you closer to God. Denying yeah. yourself and taking up your cross. Mm -hmm. That's all I see. Amen. 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 All right. Anybody else have any questions or comments? All right. <clears throat> if uh, no one else have any questions or comments, we're going to close with a word of prayer. And I'm going to ask everybody that's here uh, to stay to stay until we got just a little bit more to say. Uh, but the Lord's got some things to say to some people here that's present with us mm -hmm. right here. And so uh, we'll just go ahead and close out with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that we've had to hear what you had to say to us, Lord. And we thank you so much, God, for uh, loving us enough to tell us the truth, to speak your word to us, Lord. And God, we pray that you will give us a willing heart to submit to you, to obey what you tell us to obey, Lord. Help us to examine ourselves continually in your word, God. Help us not to be slack or slothful in reading your word, in studying your word, Lord, in and allowing your word to produce the fruit in our lives, Lord, that will bring glory to you. And Lord, right now we come to you completely submitting ourselves, Lord, opening ourselves to you, asking that you would have your way in our lives, Lord. Help us to line up with your word completely. Help us to know, Lord, that we can live holy, and Lord, and be a, a vessel of honor for use in your purpose and in your, your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.